Namaste and welcome to today's sequencing lecture. Let's take a moment to ground before we begin. So find a comfortable seat and sit up nice and tall. Allow the eyes to close and feel everything at once. Feel the cloud of sensation that is your entire body. Become aware of become aware of your head. And become aware of this notion that we have that consciousness is inside of the head, peering out. And we sort of think that's what's happening, when in fact, it's the opposite. These sensations of the head, or this feeling of having a head, this feeling of having a head is actually appearing inside of consciousness. So consciousness being that container in which all sensations, thoughts, emotions, feelings arise. Therefore, this feeling of having a head is appearing inside of consciousness. rather than consciousness appearing inside of the head. And take a deep breath through the nose. Exhale through the mouth and gently come back. Okay, so welcome back everyone. Hopefully that uh, little meditation on having a head didn't twist your melon too much. Um, let's get into sequencing. So I really love this stuff. I'm a bit of a nerd. Um, when it comes to sequencing. Um, it's really fascinating, the many different ways of sequencing that there are, uh, different approaches by different teachers. Um, yeah, and I, I'm always interested to hear um, a, a new, someone I admire's take on it and how they, how they uh, sequence their practice. Um, so yeah, I want to say at the outset, that there are many different ways to do this. Um, it's not about there being one correct way, uh, but obviously on a training that is limited time like this one, I'm going to teach you one, um, and we have already looked at one um, healthy and coherent sequencing template, um, and we'll continue to work with that. And I think it's a great template to start off with, but it's not the only template. We could have picked another one. Um, and so I, what I recommend is that you get really well accustomed with this one so that you really um, flow very easily with this sequencing template. And then once you've got it down, 
then you can start to explore another one and add to your uh, repertoire. Um, there is, um, before I was a yoga teacher, I was, um, well, I'm a bit of a film, a movie nerd. You might have seen, I've got a Star Wars uh, stormtrooper on my computer there. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, there's been much more on the back of the computer in the past. Um, but um, yeah, so I'm a bit of a movie nerd and I was always really interested in screenwriting. And one of the interesting things they teach you at film school when it comes to screenwriting is um, that there are rules to writing a screenplay and you need to learn those rules. Once you've learned the rules and once you know them inside out, then you can throw the rules out and do something different. But you're doing it consciously. So you're aware of what the rules are, of what works, and you're making a conscious choice to go, okay, I know those rules, but I'm not going to follow them. I'm going to do something else. And that can lead to something really uh, interesting and creative and effective. Um, but you need to know the rules in order to throw them out. And I think it's the same with sequencing um, yoga practices. You don't have to stick to this template. But if you change the template, it's much better if you're changing it from a position of um, intention and knowledge rather than just randomly making something up, right? So if you know why we're using the template that we're using and then you go, okay, well, I know things are supposed to be like this, but I want to create this and therefore I'm going to change the sequence then that's always great. This comes back to one of those four uh, central themes of this course. What is your intention? So anytime, um, yeah, so if you're changing the sequence, it's fine if the intention is there, if there's a, the correct intention behind the change. So when we do our practicums, um, I suggest you follow the template that we laid out last week. You know, when I did the, the boxes of preparations, warm up, um, sun salutations, standing, and so on. Um, I suggest you follow that template, but if you want to make some changes and the, there's a good reason to do so, then great. If your intention is good, then great. And we are here for you um, during this course. Should you have questions, then you can send us those questions. You can come on a, one of the live calls and, um, and ask directly, hey, this is my sequence. I want to do this. What do you think? Great. That's a great question for a live call. You can also um, email us. Um, and if you do email us, we'll probably answer it on the live call. But um, I, you can definitely get in contact with us about this kind of stuff. So having said all that, um, let's get into... Let's get into sequencing. We're going to use the template that I set up last week. I'll get a screenshot of the board from last week and add it into the notes of this lecture. Um, before you sequence a class, before you create a sequence, there are a bunch of questions that you need to ask yourself first. So let's say you've just been uh, given a job, someone says, hey, can you um, come tomorrow and teach a class um, or come next week and teach a class, right? So you go, okay, cool. That evening you sit down to create your sequence. There are a bunch of questions you need to ask yourself before you start um, creating that sequence. So what I'd like you to do is in a moment, I'd like you to pause this video and um, start to write down some of the questions that you think you need to ask yourself before you start sequencing. There are many, many questions. There are tons that you could ask yourself, um, more than we'll be able to go through in this lecture. And there is one main question, the most important question that you need to ask yourself each time. So what I'd like you to do is pause the video now and, and just write down, fill up as many of these questions as you can uh, on the page and then uh, start the video again and we'll start to go through some options that I've come up with. So you can pause now. Okay, so uh, hopefully you've got a, uh, a notebook page full of ideas here um, and I will write 
down on the board, um, some of the things that I think are important to ask. This is not a complete list. This is just a few things uh, to give you uh, a sort of idea of how this might work. So, um, the first question that you should have, uh, should be asking yourself, and hopefully you've all got this on your piece of paper, is who are my students? You know, who am I teaching? So, when we teach, we are in service to our students. So, the most important question is, who are they? Who, who are they? Who are they and what are their needs? Um, so, who am I teaching? So, this leads to a bunch of sub-categories, sub-questions. One is, um, is there a specific age group, for example? Obviously, if you are um, being called in to a school to teach a group of eight-year-olds, your sequence is going to hopefully be very different to if you've been asked to come to a retirement home and teach a bunch of 80-year-olds. Those are going to be two different sequences. So that is an important question to ask yourself before you start this process. Um, another question you might ask is, what is their level? What is their yogic you know, history of interaction with the yogic discipline to this date? So are you going to be teaching are you teaching people who are on a teacher training and you've been asked to come in and teach them morning practice one day? Or is this a, a group of people who are, um, who've never done yoga before? This kind of thing. So level, super important. That's going to really influence your, um, your sequence. Um, background. We want to be sensitive to the background of the demographic that we're coming into. Again, if you're, um, if you're coming into a, uh, let's say you're teaching yoga in a prison, um, your sequence will be very different to if you're, you've been asked to teach a church group. You know, you want to, you're going to be sensitive to their needs. If you're going into a prison, um, and Rory um, was, used to teach in prisons, um, but if you were to go into prison and, and teach young offenders or something like this, you might not, on the first class in there, be incorporating things like chakras and oming because these are the kind of things that um, can put people off to begin with if they've never uh, done yoga before. So you might say, so, okay, this is not going to be a class where I do lots of chakra-focused poses. Um, you know, similarly with uh, a... Um, with a, if you were teaching a Christian group or any other uh, religious group, you might not um, incorporate talking about the yogic deities um, very much for obvious reasons. So the background uh, of the group um, is important. And also, um, are they a specific, are they a specialized demographic? So by this I mean is there something which unites the group? For example, are you teaching corporate yoga? Are you coming into a um, business and you, they've all been sat at their desks working for the last four or five hours and then they're going to come and do a, an hour-long yoga class with you? If so, I hope that will influence your sequence. You're going to think about, well, what are the needs of this demographic? You're going to think, well, these people, they're all doing a lot of this. Let's, um, let's do something to open up the, in the other direction, for example. might be a nice idea. But you might also want to think about the fact that um, they have to go back to work afterwards. And so what does that mean? Do you want to leave them feeling energized? Do you want to help them to calm, to relax? Um, is there going to be a, uh, are there going to be restrictions by, um, uh, for example, on what clothes they're wearing? A lot of the time you turn up to a corporate yoga class and people are still wearing their work clothes. So these are people that you don't want to drench in sweat. 
um, they've got to go back to their desk afterwards. Uh, so on and so on. So these questions about who am I teaching? Who are my students? Who is my audience? Um, this, is, uh, this is super important stuff. It's the most important question. You want to get clear on as many aspects of that um, before uh, doing any sequencing at all and before moving on to the many other questions that you may have uh, written down in front of you. So, um, again, with um, the demographic, there's even, there might be some specialized requirements from the group. So, for example, maybe uh, you have, maybe you've been asked to come down and teach um, a, a group of rowers, you know, maybe the, uh, the, the rowing club are, uh, decided that they, they'd like um, some yoga classes to happen there and you might then you think about, okay, well, what's happening here? Which muscles are these guys overusing? Where are they most likely to be tight? Where are they most likely to be weak? Um, what are their needs going to be? Um, or, you know, a, a class that you design for a bunch of rowers might be very different to a class that you design for a bunch of cyclists um, or a class that you design for some pregnant people um, and so on. So they, people might come to you with a specific um, request and so you need to incorporate that as well. For example, it might be back care. You know, it might be that some, someone says to you, hey, can you come and teach this group of people? We've all got, uh, we're all suffering with back pain at the moment. We'd like someone to... Uh, teach us a bit of yoga that can help us with back pain. Okay, that's a very specific sequence. Um, so, who, who are my students and what are their needs? What are their requirements? What sequence can I create that is going to be in service to them? Um, and so, moving on, um, sort of, I guess this is still, a, uh, can still be part of this, is how many people, how many students. This is important. This will affect your sequence. If you are um, teaching three or four people, that is a different, um, that allows for some different poses that you could introduce than if you're teaching 60 or 70 people. Um, for example, if you decide if you decide you want to do um, you want to teach headstand to people for the first time, I probably wouldn't teach headstand, or I definitely wouldn't teach headstand um, to people for the first time in a group of seventy people. Why? Because I can't look around the room and keep an eye on seventy people. But if I only had three people in the class. Well, I could teach them headstand for the first time and I could even go, okay, let's, let's go one by one and help them, all three people, um, one by one. It'd be a safe way of doing it. Um, so my sequence might be affected by the amount of people in the room. Um, that's not the only reason. There are other reasons to take into consideration. Um, for example, how many students might also be linked with and what's the size of the room? Because how much space you have uh, is also important. For example, um, I teach, when I'm in London, I teach very often at Tri-Yoga, and we often get 60 or 70 people in one class, but when we do, there's that much space between each mat, right? So the mats are super close together when it's that busy. So on those occasions, I'm not gonna start going, okay, so for today's sequence, you need two bolsters and four bricks, two blocks, a strap, and so all of these props, where are they gonna put the props? There's no room for them. So if I had planned a sequence like that where we're using two bolsters and I walk in, I go, oh, there's 70 people here today. Immediately, I throw out that part of the sequence. It's gone, there's no way this is gonna work. There's probably not even enough bolsters in the room for that many people. So I have to adapt um, my sequence or or know in advance how busy this class is going to be. Um, similarly, other reasons why numbers may affect. Um, a pose which you've done with me uh, a fair few times, Supta Parangvastasana, where we're lying on the back 
and we have one leg up and then we open the leg out to the side. Again, if there's 70 people, then there's going to be someone lying next to me. And, you know, sometimes that can be kind of fun of like hover your foot over your neighbor. Um, but sometimes you might think actually that's not appropriate. Um, and so you might take that pose out of your sequence in a busy class, but you might introduce it um, in a less busy class. So how many students are there um, will affect the sequence in a variety of ways and also how many students are there and how much space do they have. Um, so now getting on to some, some other things uh, that just some ideas that might uh, influence your sequence. Um, what time of day is this class? So the practice that you offer at 6 a.m. might be very different to the practice that you offer at 8 p.m. or at lunchtime, this kind of thing. So inquire, see if, that's, uh, if it's relevant. Temperature. What is the temperature going to be when I teach this class? And I mean, this could be about, is it a heated room or not? Is this hot yoga or not? That might be a question. But also just what is the, what is the natural temperature going to be uh, anyway? For example, if it's a uh, 6 a.m. class in London in the middle of December and things are pretty cold, um, and you know, you might know, oh yeah, that studio is not particularly well heated. It's going to be cold in there at 6 a.m. Well, I probably wouldn't kick the class off with 10 minutes of meditation, five minutes of Nadi Shadana and 10 minutes of meditation, right? Because everyone's going to be sitting there freezing. These people are coming at 6 a.m. We need to get them moving quickly and build some heat because the room is cold. Um, similarly, if it's a baking hot day, um, then, you know, maybe I'm not kicking, kicking off with some fiery practices like Kapalabhati and Udiana Banner at the start. Um, and then everyone's just already like really fired up and, and it's just going to go up from there. Maybe that's not what I want to do. So what is the temperature um, could be relevant. Okay, uh, let, me, let me write that up. Um, so time of day. And temperature. And really important question, probably should have come a bit earlier, but these, are, these now are not in any particular order, just ideas. Um, <coughs> how long is the class? Of course, this is massively going to affect your sequence. Are you teaching a 40 minute lunchtime yoga class or are you teaching a two hour workshop? A wildly different. Uh, sequence you need to create for yourself there. So, um, how long? Other ideas. Um, what is the location of the class? This can affect your sequence. So, for example, um, if I am teaching in a room in a yoga studio um, then I know that my floor is going to be really flat and stable um, and maybe I know that I have access to the walls. Okay cool so I can I can put into this sequence um, headstand against the wall, I can put legs up the wall pose, um, I could incorporate some a bunch of uh, different poses where we use the wall as a prop. Um, but if I'm teaching yoga in the park, well then there's no walls and maybe I know that because I'm on grass, the floor is not so steady. So maybe I decide, um, maybe there's some like uh, very challenging balances that I would put into the yoga studio and I won't put those um, balances um, when I'm on a more unstable ground uh, in the park. Um, for example, uh, so the location can uh, affect, and then coupled with lo location is, uh, and moving on from the wall, is what props do I have access to? So location and props. Again, if you've 
built your sequence around your building up to doing um, this, this really amazing supported uh, version of, um, of uh, Supta Vidasana or something like this where, where you're all supported and lying back and but then you get there and they don't have any props. Um, that's going to put a spanner in the works. So question to ask yourself before you start the sequence is what props will I have access to? Um, another question, which, and this, is, this one has come up for me in, in uh, my personal experience, is are there, any, are there any rules from the location? Are there specific rules from the yoga studio, for example? Um, so, studio rules. And it could be rules of whoever it is that you're teaching. There might be a bunch of rules. We've already addressed some of them and might have come up in background. But studios have rules sometimes. So I know of, of a studio in London where the studio owner um, has certain rules about what you can and can't teach. And she says you, she, doesn't, uh, she doesn't want anyone to teach Warrior One. She doesn't want anyone to teach Triangle Pose. And uh, she doesn't want any Oming. Um, those are three rules. Uh, so obviously, that affects your sequence. So check in. Are there any rules that you need to pay attention to? Or for example, some studios, um, I know in certain countries in Europe, um, you have to, you're not allowed to teach shoulder stand unless people are elevated on um, blankets. So we've been using cushions so far because we didn't have blankets, but I, I do have blankets for the posture clinic uh, that we're doing on, um, on shoulder stand. So I'll show you how to use the blankets. Um, yeah, so if you were teaching in one of those countries, you would make, need to make sure that you have enough blankets for all the students that are attending. And if you don't have enough blankets, then shoulder stand would not be a part of your sequence on that day. Um, then we can start to get into, um, do you have a, is there a specific intention for this group of people? As in, do you know that this group are are interested in or looking for something more meditative or looking for something more physical or looking for something related to the emotions or looking for something related to more to energy work, this kind of thing. So is there, is there a specific intention that you might have that might be suitable for this group or might be requested by this group? So just, again, it's just a little, what's your intention? And also, what is the intention of the students in attending this uh, yoga class? Because we want to think about why are people coming, and we want to uh, we want to help um, fulfill their needs. Um, last question, just in this section. There's lots more that we can get into, um, and it, and again, these are just ones that I've come up with. Um, there's tons more that you might have come up with, and please feel free to share them. Uh, with us in the live call, but um, uh, what state are you leaving them in? And this can be important for a variety of reasons. For example, let's say you are doing the lunchtime corporate yoga gig. Um, so they've got an hour off for lunch and these uh, particular people have decided to dedicate their entire hour of their lunch break to coming to your yoga class and then the moment the class finishes, they're going back to their desk. Well, we need to bear that in mind this might not be the right time to start to do work on grief, for example. You know, and then uh, at the end of that, um, everyone is really, uh, like all these emotions come up, maybe there's some tears being shed, and boom, you need to go back to the desk and get back to accounting or something like this. 
that would probably not be the, the right time to, you wouldn't want to leave people uh, in that state. You want, you want to do that kind of class where people are going to have a bit more time to, to sit with what's come up and integrate this kind of thing. Uh, similarly, if you um, know that uh, you're teaching a practice and you finish the practice at 9 p.m. and at 9 p.m. everyone's going to jump in a car and drive away. And you want to think about that. Are you leaving them in a state that is suitable to, to you know, maybe it's a last, the last uh, practice of a retreat. So you're Sunday night in a retreat outside of your, whatever city you live in and everyone at the end of that uh, practice they're going to jump in their car and do a two-hour drive home and back to, to where, you know, where, wherever it is you came from. You want to think about that. What state are you leaving them in before they get behind the wheel of a car? You probably don't want to be doing some uh, hardcore energy pumping. Uh, you know, you remember when we did the chakra sequence um, and, and you were doing all the uh, like this, it really um, churns up all the energy and leaves you feeling very high, really. Um, you wouldn't want to be doing that just before you know someone's going for a long drive. This kind of thing. Um, when you're in a retreat context, so like a teacher training, um, like when we do these li live teacher trainings, it can be very different because I know where everyone's going to be after the class. I know that when I do the grief and anxiety practice, that that always finishes at 5.30 p.m. on a Sunday. And then I've got in the next four hours, we're going to be having dinner together. We're going to be singing together. We're going to be in the space together. And so I'm there keeping an eye on everyone. I know, you know, if, if, if anything's coming up for people, that me and the team are there to look after people, this kind of stuff. Um, but yes, you want to be, a, you want to be con considerate about what state people are going to walk away um, in. Okay, so here are just a bunch of questions that I hope uh, are helpful to you so that you can ask yourself these questions before you start to create your sequence. Like I said, there are many more um, and feel free to share. So I'm just going to uh, clean the board off. So if you one last look, if you need it, I'm just going to wipe the board. And now we'll start to get start to look a little bit more at content. So now we've really considered the needs of our students. Um, one thing that I think is, uh, uh, which I find very useful, is that each class, um, I find it useful that the class has some sort of theme, has some sort of a theme. And there are many, many different kinds of themes um, that you can do. So. Uh, again, in no particular order. There's no hierarchy here. I'm just throwing up some ideas. Um, and in fact, let's do this again. Uh, let's pause back at home. You pause the video uh, again and just write down. Come up with as many ideas as you can for ha what, what themes could you have for a class? How might you theme a class? What might you theme a class around? So please pause the video now, get out all your ideas and come back. Okay, so no particular order here, just some ideas. You can theme your class around a body part or region. By this I mean you can uh, decide to target a specific body part. You might say, okay, we're going to target the outer hips and outer thighs. We're going to target the arches of the feet. We're, this is a class that is about the adductors. Uh, this is a cl the class that is about the trapezius muscle. Like You could um, pick a body part or a region. It doesn't have to be a specific body part, it could be, uh, you know, the hips. Um, 
or um, opening the shoulders or back bends, something like this. So that can be um, that can be nice. You could also it could be a bit more specific than back bends. It could be this could be a class about back strengthening. Um, this could be a, a class about rotational core, a specific movement um, of the core, so on. These kind, this is one way to theme. Sticking with uh, the physical body, you could also create what is known as a peak pose class. Oops. A peak pose. So in a peak pose class, this is where the, the whole class and that, that structure that I showed you last week from warm up preparations through to your sun salutations, through to standing, through to your balances, all the way through um, that sequencing template, everything is preparing the students to approach a specific um, pose that you're building up to. That pose could be many, many things. Maybe it's forearm balance. Maybe it's handstand, maybe it's headstand, maybe it's some sort of arm balance, maybe it's a back bend. Um, and so right the way through, you are um, creating a sequence that is going to best prepare the students to approach that pose when they get to it. Um, you do have uh, a couple of sequences like that with me on this course. There's one, um, the back bends uh, practices are like this. So we're building up to, to doing a specific back bend um, towards the sort of two thirds into the class or towards, uh, yeah, like uh, it, it basically building up to it. And then once you've done the peak pose, then everything starts to calm down. So this can be a nice, uh, a nice way to sequence if you're paying attention to the physical body and the asanas themselves. But of course, as we know, it's not about all about asana. And there might be maybe your um, theme is not even asana related. Maybe you're going to theme a whole class around the chakras or a specific chakra. So you could do a whole class on Anahata chakra, building unconditional love. You could do a whole class on Manipura chakra, building confidence and willpower and determination. Do a whole class on uh, Vishuddha chakra, communication, truth, purity, um, self-expression, creativity. So yeah, you could pick a specific chakra for a specific class, or you could pick a selection of chakras, or do as we've done on this course, all seven chakras, many things you can do. You could also pick an element. It doesn't have to be the chakra, you could just be cultivating. Let's cultivate the element of earth in this uh, practice. Let's cultivate air whatever um, it is. Um, you could use these beautiful lectures you've been having with Rory, the yamas and niyamas. You could pick a yama or a niyama as a, um, as a theme. Ahimsa, Satya, Ramacharya, you know, conserving your energy. That is a great theme for a asana practice. Um, you might um, theme an entire class around a quote. So you might start the class off with a quote. Yoga chitta vritti nirodaha. Yoga is the state in which the mental and emotional fluctuations have become still. And then theme a class around that. Um, um, the koshas. You know, this, this class is on pranamaya kosha. This class is on uh, manamaya kosha. This class is on vijnanamaya kosha. Uh, or maybe a journey through the koshas. You could do a specific 
and deity. Uh, this class is uh, around Ganesh. This class is themed around Krishna or Mother Mary or whatever it is that um, speaks to you. Um, perhaps it's around a specific emotion or perhaps it's around dealing with a specific emotion. So perhaps it's a class that is focused around dealing with anxiety. Perhaps it's a class around dealing with grief or dealing with anger. Perhaps it's a class around cultivating compassion, cultivating uh, unconditional love, cultivating whatever it is that it is that you want to uh, work with. So this can be a really nice way of theming. Um, you might also relate your theme to what's happening in the world right now. For example, perhaps you relate your theme to the movements of the moon. So maybe this is a class related to the new moon or um, the black moon or the full moon or whatever it is. So um, moon cycle. Maybe you theme it um, around seasons. You know, maybe there's a, okay, then, so today is uh, the beginning of autumn, so this class is about ushering in the autumn. Maybe you will relate your class to some sort of celebration or festivity. Uh, for example, um, you know, if you're in a, you live in a community that are celebrating um, whatever it is, Eid, Christmas, whichever, uh, Diwali, whatever um, local celebrations are happening, maybe you incorporate that into the class. Of course, you want to always be um, very sensitive to doing this because maybe not everyone in the class is celebrating this particular um festival but for example you could still take it into account like uh, a good example of this is if you are teaching in london or in any city in in the west i imagine but um uh and many other places too but uh i'm just saying london because it's my main experience but if you're teaching in london on the 22nd or 23rd of december the whole city is is losing its mind over Christmas, and it's um it's a it's a hectic place to be. Uh, being on the public transport on those days is challenging to say the least. Everyone's like really stressed out. Oh my god! Oh my god! I'm gonna get my Christmas shopping done, and everyone's like uh, you know super uh, wound up, and then. People are coming into your yoga class. It's a sort of like one place they come to get a little bit of a uh, bit of peace and some respite from the, the chaos and the madness out there. Um, that might be something that you incorporate. You know, this is okay. This this is this class is themed around taking a break from the Christmas shopping chaos. This kind of thing. Um, so you can incorporate what's happening uh, into into your class, and of course. That spreads into what's happening politically uh, as well. Or right now we're in the middle of a pandemic. So this is going to affect your sequence. If you are teaching, um, if you're teaching in the middle of, of the pandemic, there are obviously a bunch of restrictions. There's social distancing that you need to take into account. So you can't uh, do things that we used to do right now, like say, okay, everyone, get into partners. We're going to do some handstand practice. No, there's no partner work allowed. So that is not um, going to be part of your sequence. Um, you, um, right now in most yoga studios, you cannot use any props because they don't have the capacity to clean the props after each class. So the props have just been removed. So, you know, this is stuff that you want to think about. What is happening out there? Again, politically, if you know there's an election happening or just happened, 
maybe you want to allow that maybe you want to let that influence the sequencing in some way or the way that you present the class. Not because you should be going, uh, creating a class going, oh yeah, there's an election this week, we need to vote out X, Y, or Z. Um, I'm not suggesting that, although you may choose to do that. Um, but more that, let's take this uh, American election that is happening um, next week as I film this uh, now. Um, you know, whatever your political affiliations are, in that week after that election, there's going to be a lot of very upset people. Whoever wins, right? whichever side wins, the other side is going to be really, really affected, uh, really, really upset. And, and so, if you were teaching in America, then that would be something you'd want to take into account. The chances are, in the classes that week, there's going to be some um, very scared, enraged people in your class. Do you want to allow that to, um, you know, maybe speak to that or um, remind yourself to have that extra bit of compassion uh, in your teaching that week? Um, so, again, this is, this is not a comprehensive list of themes. I probably, there's probably a few things on here that I've forgotten and I'll be kicking myself later about, oh, why didn't I say that? But um, there's lots more themes um, that people uh, can introduce, to introduce, you know, horoscopes and uh, Chinese New Year, or whatever, like uh, and the Chinese animals of, uh, that are associated with each year, and so on and so on. You can, infinite uh, number of, um, of themes and ways of theming that you could come up with. Um, and um, there is also what um, one of my teachers calls a, a potpourri class. A, a potpourri class, um, and this is back to being, when you're thinking of more of a, uh, of a physical asana class, so um, you're thinking more on the physical body, a potpourri class is where you give someone a little bit of everything. So yeah, we talked about, um, you know, a body, a specific body part or region, so like a back bends class or a hip openers class or shoulder openers class, this kind of thing. But you could also do a potpourri class, which is like, okay, I've got these people for an hour and I'm just going to make sure that they get a little bit of all of the different, um, all of the different aspects that we can incorporate into a a asana class, and so um, um, this can be. This is pretty much covered by if you followed the um, if you followed the template which I introduced you to last week, and which in the first sequencing lecture, and which we'll put the screenshot of that template in the notes to this lecture. If you follow that, then actually that is a pretty rounded practice. We've done, incorporated in that pretty much all of the movements. Um, but I'll just write up, you can sort of split it into, um, into six different, um, different gestures, you might say. One of my teachers uh, refers to these as the six gestures of asana. So here you have, um, and again, in no particular order, um, but you can, you would have, let's say, forward folds, uh, back bends. This is not in any particular order. Just six things that you want to incorporate into your class. Um, forward folds, back bends, twists. And core work. Um, inversions. And hip openers. And actually, I would I'd add a seventh, which is balance, balances. So, 
If you incorporated all seven of these things into your um, practice, I'd say that's a, that's a pretty physically balanced practice. Um, and in fact, all of these except hip openers are incorporated in the template from last week, right? So we, we, we had all of these had their own bit, forward fold, back bends, twists. Remember we said core work can go anywhere, inversions at the end, balances were there. And hip openers are there really because the whole standing sequence, the whole warrior sequence are hip openers. It's really good sequence of, uh, of hip openers, the standing sequence. So those seven um, gestures, shall we say, is if we wanted to just offer a balanced, let's say, whatever, 45 minute class, hour long class, but you want to keep, make sure that we hit a little bit of everything um, on, the, on the physical body, then incorporate those um, seven things. Um, a few things to keep in mind, that we are looking for integration. We're looking for union. We're looking to create yoga. So looking to create that yoga between body, breath, and mind. So as you look at your sequence, just ask yourself that question. Am I, am I doing a good job here of integrating body, breath, and mind? Um, follow that sequencing pattern that we looked at last week of the arc. So you go from relaxing to challenging and back to um, relaxing again. Um, and it's a nice idea, I think, that you, in, in every class, to incorporate, um, incorporate at, at least one challenge somewhere. Do something that's going to challenge your class. And remember, that's not what's going to challenge you, that's what's going to challenge them. That might be very different. So something that's challenging for the group, and also something that the group can really enjoy. It's nice to incorporate those two things, uh, whatever that means to you. Um, and with all of these ideas in mind, I strongly, strongly encourage you to write down every sequence that you do. And I would say this, I would encourage you to do this for the first five years of teaching, that you write down your sequence ahead of the, of the class for two reasons. Um, one, it's really gonna get, get, it's really gonna sort out your sequencing and your class is going to be um, much more uh, efficient and accurate as a result. And two, it gets really exhausting writing um, when you become busy and you have a lot of classes, constantly having to come up with new sequences all the time is time consuming and challenging and exhausting. And what's really useful is that you have a folder or a book of sequences that you've already written. So when that call comes and the local cycling group say, hey, can you come down? We want, we want to do some yoga and you know, release, uh, uh, create some opening in the legs, this kind of thing. You can just go, oh yeah, I taught a cycling group last year. I still got that sequence, where is it? Here it is. And you don't have to write it again. Yeah, you've just got that sequence already prepped. This is gold, believe me. I've, got, I've written down the majority of my sequences and it is, it is just so, um, it's just such a good resource to have to be able to go, oh, you know, okay, I wanna do a core class. Let's go back to that core class I did last year look at it and of course I can now update it and improve it but rather than having to sit down again and go okay let's come up with a whole bunch of ideas for a core class I've already got one I've got a template now let's evolve it so for these two reasons um, write down your sequence and for the purposes of certainly this um, course and your practicums Absolutely, write them down. You'll see that when I teach your morning practices, often I have a piece of paper next to the mat that has the um, that has some notes on. Not always. Sometimes um, it's subjects that I know really well and teach really often. For example, the backbends practice. I don't I don't need notes for that. I can just um, do it. Um, or the outer hips practice. Feel totally you know comfortable, sort of in flow with that. 
Um, and then there are other ones um, where the timing is more of a challenge. And so I need some notes. And that's what I'm going to do. Um, we'll take a, a break in a moment. And after the break, we'll come back and I'm going to show you how to write a sequence. And this is really magical stuff. This is, um, this is, yeah, this is going to be super uh, useful to you. So let's take a, a water in, water out break right now. Um, and then come straight back and we'll dive into the next part of this sequencing lecture. Thank you.